All right, traders, welcome to today's recap. This is Christian from Hertz Travica Trade Group. And today is Wednesday, June 30th. So this is the end of the, officially, even though it's a Wednesday, it's the end of the month. It is end of the quarter. And we are now halfway through 2021. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, performance. We'll go over some, I just put together some numbers really quickly just to kind of um, look at some of the, performers year to date which is it's a pretty interesting list and um, I'll talk a little bit about my performance for the um, for the half year I'll do more I always for for members I always do a, um, a video just for a summary for the month you know some takeaways uh, some you know things that went well some improvements adjustments to make going forward you know just an overall summary so I do that for members that'll be Probably I'll do that after the close tomorrow, unless I can, uh, maybe not uh, tomorrow we have a, a member webinar. So um, that will be um, at some point at the end of the week, I'll put together that uh, that member uh, video for, for P&L um, year to date and, and of course just for um, for June. But um, yeah, so let's, let's talk about a couple things here first. So first of all, we'll talk about... Um, Today's price action, you know, pretty muted. The S and P was what um, up about ten basis points. I think the the Qs were down a little bit. Oh, by the way, risk disclaimer in front of you: everything that we're going through is for information purposes only. Not giving out any recommendations or um, anything of that nature. Uh, this video is for education purposes only. If the screen is a little bit blurry, it's just because YouTube has not fully rendered the uh, the high def version of the video. So just give it a little bit more time if it uh, if it appears fuzzy. So um, yeah, and the Qs actually finished down a little bit. They underperformed just a touch. Small caps were flat as well. So, uh, you know, the major averages were, were basically flat. There was a little, little small rotation going on, a little bit. Uh, metals and mining outperformed for the day. Energy also outperformed for the day. XOP, I think, was the best performing uh, sector. That was up almost 2% for the day. And um, a little bit of underperformance in things like things that have done pretty well recently. Software names were down 1.3% for the day. Solar was down 2.7%. Clean energy, you know, those two areas have been very strong uh, the past week. Clean energy, solar, uh, those were your underperformers for the day. The Chinese internet names, which we've talked about quite a bit, they under they lagged and they underperformed uh, despite some you know positioning that we've been seeing on the call side uh you know interesting the bio you know as strong as the gene companies have been you know the names like um edit uh crispr which i've been trading and um and and the what's the third one that i can't think of right now but that's the actually the the big performer um i should be able to find it if i go into xbi because i'm now i'm drawing a complete blank Actually, it'll, it's in the ARC ETFs. Uh, where is this thing? NTLA. Wow, it actually backed off some. It was only up about uh, 7%. Edit, Beam. Um, like I said, I played CRISPR. Where did this thing finish for the day? NT. Did it give back a lot of the gains? Wow, it hit 202 and finished at 160. That's some volatility for you. How about that? You know, and this is kind of how this this year has been going. You know, it's been one of these years, you know, that if you, <laughs> in some things, not everything, but I feel like in some things, you have to take targets. You got to take targets and things. You know, if you're not selling, um, you know, in a name that goes up 50 bucks today and then gives it all, gives almost the whole move back, finishes right around the open. So crazy. Um, I didn't notice that. At, I didn't see that at the end of the day because, like I said, I haven't been trading this one. But wow, that's some volatility. 202 finishes at 161, and it's and it's not a meme stock. But um, like I said, I, I just feel like you know it's crazy when you when I'm going to bring up the uh, the raw numbers in just a minute. But I feel like that's just how you know in terms of some names this year. You just have had to take profits in in some things and be a be a very disciplined trader. But um, yeah, so that's the those were the underperformers, um, you know. And XBI was down on the day despite all those names. Um, also, really interesting too, um, not to get sidetracked here, but you know, if if you look at the Arc ETFs, right? Arc has well, they've got a couple ETFs, but you know, a couple ones that I look at. 
right? So, so for instance, this one, right? The Arc Innovation ETF. This has Edit, Beam, CRISPR, NTLA in there. You know, it's got a lot of exposure, and you know. And I think that kind of makes sense. These are innovative companies, right? So they should go in there. But if you look at the ARC Genomic ETF, this is this is the one that I find surprising, right? So um, this is Genomic Revolution ETF. So it does include multiple. It does say that it includes multiple sectors in here, but. I would think that th this would have been up more today. And if you look at the top weights, it's actually Teladoc is the biggest weight in this thing. So again, a little bit different. Like I would think that you would look in this thing and it would be, you know, so, you know, the other way around where you would see some of the biggest performers. Um, and I guess some, they, they are in here as well, but they're not, I think they're bigger weights in the ARC Innovation ETF. So just kind of interesting, it, you know, always in an ETF. People sometimes get it confused with ETFs, but the way ETFs work, especially if they're just an equity ETF and, they're, and they don't have futures underlying or anything, they're just a product wrapper, right? They're just the performance of of, um, of what they track, of what the underlying basket tracks, right? And, you know, for the most part, sometimes, you know, back in the day before there was liquid market makers, there would be a little bit of an ARB between the ETF and the underlying basket. But the markets are so efficient right now, and there's plenty of market participants who do do that ARB when it gets just slightly out of line. But you really, in, in, in your regular plain vanilla equity ETFs, the product is, is just tracking what the you know, what the, um, what the basket is. So, you know, again, like I said, I didn't want to get sidetracked here, but, you know, remember, you know, just because an ETF will call itself one particular name, you really have to look and dig through the components to make sure it's, it's, you know, an ETF that you want to own. You know, there's several examples of that. Um, you know, one of which is always the home builders, right? There's there's the XHB, which call, is called the home building ETF. It doesn't have very many home builders in it. Um, the one that has all the home builders in it is called the home construction ETF. That's ITB, right? And, and you know, by the names, you may get thrown off. But anyway, like I said, I didn't want to get sidetracked for the day. But, um, you know, really quick in terms of trading, um, I always have difficulties the, these last day of the month, um, you know, probably even more or so on the quarter end. There's just a lot of very whippy moves. Moves. Some of the some of the names that have been performing pretty you know fairly well they get sold, um, and some of the underperformers tend to kind of get bought a little bit. It's a weird phenomenon. Um, now you would think because I you know being that there's six months of the year that have gone by, I think I've probably been down four or five uh, times on the the very last day of the month, right? So my my months are. You know, we'll talk about overall performance. I'm just, I'm just referring to the last trading day of the month. It's been for me um, bad. So if you've done better on the last trading day of the month um, than I have, but I've gone, I've been down almost every time. Um, you know, and it's one of those things where, well, hey, do you want to unwind all your positions if you know that you're going to be down the last trading day of the month? Well, I mean, I guess that's one thing that you could do. But keep in mind, usually on the first day of the month, which is tomorrow, usually, not always, but there's usually new money being put to, to, to work in the market. So, you know, what are you going to do? Take all your positions off the day before and then put, put them right back on, like towards the end of the day as things sell off. But, um, you know, that's just what I typically what I um, you know see every they're just always tricky trading days. So I, I, I mentioned that in the trading room. I mentioned that the day before I mentioned the pre-market, but it's still even though I know it's coming um, and I try to be a little bit defensive and you know I think a couple of things that I sold today like I, I've been trying to trade a little bit of Apple. Um, where did Apple close for the day? And, and it was like, son of a gun, Apple's going to close on the high of the day. Eh, it was up, you know, not that big of a move. That's the way Apple's been moving. Um, but I did try to sit in that trade for a little while. Um, here, were, here were my trades for the day. You know, again, trying to take some profits always on the open. Um, I got another, got my second target in Home Depot. Um, I tried going long, you know, I thought Amazon, um, and it, this trade may still work, but again, Amazon is one of those names that seems to be always weak. Um, you know, either towards the, sometimes the tor towards the end of the week, but a lot of times at the end of the month, right? But it's still kind of sitting here, 
But um, I was trying to take a target on the highs of the day, and I, the market maker just would not give me a break and, and fill me. So you could see that this thing actually finished red on the day, but is still kind of holding this trend line. So I stayed in it um, just because I know the situation with um, this end, end of the month phenomenon. All right. So um, a couple other things. This <laughs> this work day, you know, what can I do besides, you know, chuckle a little bit? Sometimes this just happens. Um you know, a lot of big calls went up uh, yesterday in Workday, and this stock's down 3%. Um, this is why yesterday I just kind of pieced into the trade, but this is particularly painful um, when you have something like this. Um, you know, I put this trade on right at the end of the day. Um, you know, I added a, just a little bit of a trade in Workday September, you know, September calls, and there's plenty of time with this. But, you know, when a, when a name goes down 3% and you're in calls, you're, you get smoked. So that was one, that was my biggest loser for the day. Um, Upstart, I, you know, one of the things I said with Upstart was, um, and I even posted a comment once when, when I hit my second target. I don't trust this company um, because it does this a lot. It did this. It did this last week. It got going last week, and it's it gets hit with sellers, right? So there's this is what we call overhead supply when this happens. So I took multiple targets. You know, I, I my target was 134. Um, you could see I put this trade on here. And I said most likely a day trade. I took a quick target at 129. I took another target, um, 130. I took one more target at 133, and then I took the very last piece off um, as it was declining um, for 129.50. But it, it's just too difficult. This name is too difficult. It's okay, I think, to day trade, uh, but you got to keep an eye, you got to keep an eye on it. You know, a, a very close eye on it. So made a little bit of money day trading that one. Um, Apple, like I said, I got out of very quickly. Um, CRISPR was um, also kind of my trade of the day. So I had some nice trades, but like I said, trades that, that I was wearing, um, you know, in, into today, just, you know, a couple of them um, went very badly for me. <laughs> so again, I, you know, this is what it is for me at the end of the month. So I, I completely now expect it. Um, so CRISPR, you know, one of the things that I noticed with CRISPR was that, you know, after this gap up, it was kind of hanging in here. I exited this trade fully the other day. And what I noticed was that it was trying to kind of turn back up a little bit. So I took advantage of this. Uh, this was a really nice trade for me today. Uh, right. So back in um, 152.35, which was, which is right on the turn of this. And, um, you could see that multiple virgin point of controls have been taken out. Now there's another one up here at 186. But again, as I talk about in these videos, you know, this is great, uh, great information in terms of these names that have overhead supply. They're going to kind of uh, many times it's like they're going to hit a brick wall when it's they come across an area of high volume, previous high volume that has never been revisited. Right now, you also have a similar one on the daily chart. So same thing, right? This thing took this thing out. So it's really nice, you know, this market webs indicator that we have and we've been using for now, you know, a number of years. It's just very beautiful to, and it takes the emotion out of trading in terms of knowing where to take your exits, right? So again, it's it's using the market profile and it's putting some, some you know, statistics behind it. Um, and you could see this is the this was the point of control for the month of March. And you could see how price was didn't even go through this value or let, let alone cross the the uh, the point of control so that's really what it is it's it's when price does not cross the point of control for that period it leaves one of these um you know kind of it's not a gap but it's a similar concept to a gap where there's just a lot of uh, it's a big volume pocket right and as soon as price kind of returns to it um it's nothing's 100 percent, but a lot of times you get that you get you know price gets to it and then gets rejected Right. Um, think of it as also like a, a lot of what they refer to as dead bodies. Right. A lot of people who are long and they're waiting for the stock to get back to a, a level which is very close to their cost basis where they can actually you know exit it. Right. So that's also um, how this works. But, you know, again and again, it really provides some great signals and some great exit points. So for now, um, this was a this was a nice trade for the day. All right. And where was my last, uh, 
yeah, so I hit 165. So that's perfect for a day trade. All right, again, so I put this in here. Sticking to plan last trading day of the month and trying not to trade too much, add exposure. I did add a couple things in here. I thought this Airbnb, let's see where this thing finished. You know, so it's right around this 153 level. Again, I don't want to jump in with two feet with this thing because just like we talked about with that upstart, right? This is this also has some issues around this 153, 154 level. Specifically, it keeps getting rejected, right? So you know that there's probably an active seller in this thing around this 153 level. So if if it can get above this range, you got some daylight, right? And it looks pretty damn good on on, you know, now it's first day back above the 50 day moving average the price action um you know the moving average now now caught up to the price action so I, I think it's worth a shot did i put on a big position here no absolutely not because i want to see this kind of prove it first right so you know that's the whole key right it is to take emotion out of trading um you know, so many people, you know, so many young, younger traders on Twitter, they're all about trading with emotion and catching falling knives. You know, real traders, you know, technical traders, um, they wait until they've got they've got a little bit of confirmation. Now, some so this right is a little bit of confirmation, but it's a little bit soon. Right. So that's why you could start a position and then kind of go from there and realize if it doesn't work, you take it off and you take it off for a small offs and you live to fight another day. Right. But, you know, we've seen so many of these traders, you know, over the last six months, you know, try to stick their neck out and say, oh, this is a good buy. It's cheap. Yada, yada, yada. No, wait for confirmation and wait till you have a level to trade against. Um, you're going to do much better in this game, in my opinion, if you kind of set yourself up to succeed rather than set yourself up to possibly fail, you know, trying to stick your neck out and call the bottom and stuff. All right. So, you know, my stop for this would be, you know, right around, you know, it could be 150, you know, it could be prob probably 145, right? We're going to have a new value area for the month. So I would set my stop to 146. Again, I could have a little bit more tolerance for my stop price because I don't have a big position in this, right? I'm just giving this a little bit of a, of a starting chance. Um, I also went into a little bit of an energy play to just recognize the strength there. All right, so that's my trades for the day. I mentioned I would go over some performance. Um, my performance, so let's, first of all, let's, um, I'll bring up my spreadsheet that has um, some data in it, but you've got for the year, um, the S&P is, is up about 14.5% for the year. Talk about a crazy year, right? I think a lot of people have had issues with this. Um, you know, if you look at, say, you know, a, a very high growth portfolio, what is it, ARC? Um, Sorry, I'm thinking about something else, but the the Arc Innovation ETF, um, you know, which I know a, a lot of traders are in high growth stuff year to date, only up five percent year to date, right? Versus the Spy is up fourteen and a half percent. The Qs are up thirteen percent, right? IWM is up seventeen percent year to date, right? So this is so like this could be considered a very good year what we have so far for half a year. So it'll be interesting to see how the rest of the year plays out. But yeah, I mean, you've had to be really flexible and nimble and, you know, do something else, you know, to to outperform than staying in high growth, which is, you know, again, this is not just high growth, um, but this ARK Innovation ETF is only up 5% year to date. So um, so where am I? I'm up about 32, 33% for the year in my trading account. I will send that formally out tomorrow on Twitter as I do every um, as I do every month, right? I'm consistent with um, putting out my PL every month, right? Um, it's one thing that I think I wish more traders would do, regardless of they're if they're up, they're down, right? There's too many people. There's there's too many people on Twitter, in my opinion, that are deceiving people um, because they don't ever show their performance. Um, you know, and, and I just don't think that that's right. You know, people that I'm referring to that have 50,000, 100, 200, 300,000 followers and they never show their performance. Um, I don't know. I have a problem with that, right? If, if you're never showing what your results are, you're doing a lot more sales than you are actually trading. But that's my opinion. I think it's very important to show your results and, and also monitor, you know, how you're doing. Um, 
you know, this is the first year for me in the U.S. investment con contest. So, you know, I will try to, I'll be doing that contest again next year. I'll probably will take a little bit of a different approach uh, in that contest, but I would encourage people, you know, sign up for that contest. If you're serious and, you know, even I would say if you're running a service, like I run obviously the Tribeca Trade Group, right? I don't know how some of these other folks run a trading service and they don't ever show their performance, um, you know, it's one thing to, you know, what we do is education, but you got to be able to at least, you know, talk about what you're doing and how you execute it. So in any event, I, I, you know, I would encourage anybody, anybody who's listening to this video. And if they're, if they're a member of someone else's service, ask them, why are they not showing their performance, right? You're paying a fee, right? And, and all of the Tribeca Trade Group members, right? You're paying a fee. Um, you know, I try to give the best information. I try to give very good trade setups and I try to be transparent. Um, I don't I don't get it how anyone can run a service and not be transparent with how they're doing, you know, year to date. Right. And I get it. It's been a tough year to trade, but you got to be transparent. Um, so let's take a look at sectors just for a minute too. Right. You know, before I reveal well you probably just saw a glimpse of it, but you know, it's pretty interesting when you look at year to date uh, sector performers, very different than what you might think, right? So, you know, going back to this S&P, which is up 14.5%, right? It is a function of what names are in the S&P and what sectors um, and so on and so forth. And when you break it down, energy is up 65 <laughs> Oil and gas, which is the, the equally weighted ETF, is up 65% year to date. I did double check that because I was like, wow, that's a, that's a big number. Um, and if you look at some of the other ETFs, you know, the XL, XLE is market cap weighted. Um, that's up 42%. Steel is up 38%. So while these, some of these areas like steel and some of the materials have dropped off a little bit because there's been a rotation back into growth, I mean, these numbers are very strong still. XME is up 29% year to date, right? That is a big move. Financials are up 24.5%. Home builders are up 24%. The semis up 20%, right? And then you start to kind of trail off tech, you know, which is pretty much is just underperforming the S&P just a touch. I, you know, has come back decently the last couple of weeks, but that's up 14% year to date. Consumer discretionary, which all, you know, these are the, are, I believe these are the two biggest weights when you look at, um, Right when you look at um, the biggest weights in, in terms of sectors, uh, actually healthcare is the second. Uh, consumer discretionary is right behind that. So 27% is tech in the S and P, 13% is healthcare, and um, and and 12% is consumer discretionary. Financials are next. So you know there goes your performance, and uh, healthcare is not too far behind there. 11%. Interesting, their weights are so similar in the S&P and their performance is so similar, 11% year to date. And then you've got some of your underperformers, even though TAN has had a good week, solar, um, it's still down 13% for the year, down 10 and down. Clean energy is uh, down 9%. Chinese internets, which recently started to come back a little bit, uh, are still down 9% for the year. So um, the main point, or one of the main points, besides just looking at the raw numbers, is just realizing how flexible you've had to be this year to achieve good results. Um, it, like I said, for given, you know, the performance of the indices so far this year, I, I think that this has been one, <laughs> given that it's still one of the most difficult trading environments, given the rotations that we're seeing, uh, you know, on a, on a either week to week basis or, or month to month basis. Um, but you get the small caps up 17%. You know, if I didn't know, if our, if I hadn't been actively trading uh, this year I w and looking at these numbers, I would have said, wow, this has been a really awesome year. Um, and it is. You know, I'm happy with my performance, even though it's not nearly as what it was last year, which was up over 300% last year. Um, but up 30, 32, 33%, I I'm, you know, I'm content with that. Do I wish it was up a bit more than that? Of course. But... Um, you know, given what we've had to deal with, this massive rotation out of growth and into value, 
and then a rotation a bit back into growth, you've had to be really quick. Uh, an example which I, I thought was, was really good, um, and this is Eric Baltunez from, uh, Bloom, from Bloomberg. He tweeted this out the other day. And, you know, it just kind of goes to show you if you rotate at the wrong time and if you're not watching technical signals, I think he's got this up some someplace. Uh, maybe I went, maybe I went right by it. Let's see. Well, I tweeted that. Let's see. Let me go to my profile. Yeah. Um, you know, so this is the momentum ETF. They rotated, you know, they did this late May rebalance, right? Scheduled rebalance that this momentum ETF does. And they rotated out of growth and, and a lot into... Uh, a lot into value at exactly the wrong time, you know. So they they move their financial allocation um, from 1.6 to 33 percent at exactly the wrong time, and they sold out of tech at exactly the wrong time. So it's been it's like I said, you know, I think tricky is the way to classify it, um, and I think there's a lot to be learned from this year, right? This whole thing with the diamond hands and so forth. I'll say it again, and, and and I'm happy to elaborate more on it, but probably one of the worst things that you could ever say to someone is to not sell and not take a stop price if you are in this for trading. Now, again, if, if you're if you're a 20-year-old and you've got a 30-year time horizon, you know, 40-year time horizon, okay, you could say diamond hands for some things because you've got a long time horizon and, and you know, you're, you're building your wealth in, in that age. But if you're an active trader and someone tells you diamond hands, uh, probably the, the worst advice um, and so, so many bad things, right? You know, this year and last year started off with that it's been so great to see so much more participation and for, you know, basically another, you know, new generation of people to, to get involved and get excited about the markets. Um, and that was, you know, last year that really turned, you know, we were really, you know, a great spot. And then, you know, what kind of transpired this, you know, the, this, uh, 2021 has been a bunch of nonsense too. You know, I mean, just basically going at, you know, uh, um, message rooms. And the only thing that they talk about is short interest and going after hedge funds. You know, I'm, I'm telling you that this is one of the greatest games out there to be an active trader and to sit and to analyze companies and analyze stocks and so forth. But, you know, you don't need to come up with an excuse to outperform um, the market. If you do your due diligence, there's there's no reason to make excuses and say that hedge funds have an advantage and so on and so forth. You ha have, have so many more advantages than hedge funds do. Um, you could be much faster in and out of positions. So it, it, it really, uh, without getting off track here, it is it really went down a bad road in terms of going out to get hedge funds and, and I'm going to take the other side of their positions. You know, that's, that's not, you know, <laughs> that's not trading, right? That's trading with, with emotion and, um, you know, really clouding what, what kind of started last year was just to get people excited, um, to, to trade and, and to make money. And it, it just really morphed into something very negative. And, you know, it, it's a shame that it did, you know, to, to, you know, have that kind of passion to say, um, I'm, I'm going to go after this, only this name and only this name and only this name. I mean, we still have that with a couple names now, right there, you know, there's a couple names right now, like, like a wish or, um, uh, you know, we were talking about this name yesterday too, SoFi. Like, it's okay to like companies, but to see on Twitter just only people talking about this company Wish, I, I just, I just don't get it. I, I can understand, like, okay, you could take a speculative position in this, but it's like people are betting way too much, or you know, putting way too much on such a speculative small company, you know, and um, you know, I, I hope that changes for 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 a lot of traders who are new and, and, you know, into this game for, for the first time, um, you know, and I get it. Everybody has to get experience and, and make mistakes, but, you know, it's really a shame to see people think that they, that they have to collude and try to manipulate a name to make money. 
that's not what it's all about. You know, it's it's all it's about learning a process, right? And being a disciplined trader, um, and studying a company, studying a chart, knowing where to buy it, knowing where the trade doesn't work, right? And so on and so forth. So I I could talk for a long time about this this concept, but you know, I just hope it gets better, and and I hope some of these people who are going about it, I think, the wrong way. I I hope that they learn, and um you know, and, and get better at, at what they're doing so that they can, you know, they can make money without trying to collude a name and, and pump and dump and, you know, and that type of thing. So this video is now 30 minutes long, which is longer than I like to go in these videos. But, you know, I wanted to kind of summarize a little bit of what we've kind of seen this year, um, the rotations, uh, the performance, you know, where it's extracted from, um, both in the in the major indices and some areas like, you know, how high growth and how it's been, you know, a different picture than what we saw um, last year, completely different picture. So anyway, that's my that's my longer than usual summary. Um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to um, to email me or you can send me something on Twitter and uh, we'll go from there. Have a great night, everybody.